Cool. Thanks, Zane. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, some new tracing capabilities that we've added to Pixie. Um, so we've been focusing on adding more protocols so you get more out of the box observability using Pixie. And we've added two new protocols that we wanted to announce today. So I'm super excited to say that we now have support for Kafka and Nats. Um, both of these protocols are essentially message bus systems. So you can uh, post messages kind of in a pub sub kind of way. And then uh, you have consumers which can, can uh, read the messages off. And uh, these two protocols work the same way that uh, we trace all the other protocols that we have inside Pixie. So this is part of our eBPF based approach. Um, you don't have to instrument anything. Uh, you don't have to change any lines of code. You don't need even to redeploy anything. We just automatically use eBPF to snoop all the traffic and then we <laughs> detect whether that traffic is uh, Kafka or Nats. And when we detect that, we automatically start tracing it for you. And then we surface it up through the, the Pixie uh, platform so that you can see all the uh, good data. Um, and I'll be showing a demo uh, in a second so you can kind of see how that feels. Um, before I get into the demo, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what it is that kind of what it is that we're actually tracing kind of under the hood. So uh, at the bottom of this slide here, what I have is a screenshot of some of the raw data that we're actually capturing. So this is the data table that, that drives everything else inside of Pixie. And so you can see that um, each row is kind of an event that we've traced. And for every event, we have a timestamp of when that message occurred. We have a source and destination. So which pod did it come from? Which pod was it going to? Um, and in this case, since it's Kafka traffic, we have a command. So you can see that there's some uh, fetch commands here happening. Fetch is when it's going when, Kafka, when there's a consumer trying to get data from Kafka. There's some produce commands, which is when a, a producer is writing data to Kafka. Um, and so you can see all the kind of traffic that's going on. And in addition to that, um, because of the eBPF based approach, you can actually get all of the uh, content of the messages as well. So we grab a bunch of information, metadata, and actually the body. Um, so you can see some of that in here. Like if you look at the produce request, which is the third record, you can see that there's in the response, there's a topics order. So we know that this particular produce request was just published something to the topic called order. So Kafka organizes all of its messages into, uh, into topics. And this one was posted, something was posted to the order topic. Um, you can also see uh, when you click on them, you can click on any record, you can see more details about it. Um, so same information, just zooming in here. You can see, for example, this is a different example. We see a request command that was a fetch. So we've kind of automatically traced that some consumer uh, dispatched a fetch to the Kafka server. And then again, here we see it's also to the same topic. So if you look down near the bottom, you see name order. That was the order topic. And it gives us all the information like the partition and the message number and all sorts of other goodies um, in terms of what's happening. So you can debug your applications. Um, finally, on the right, we have the request latency. This is the latency at the protocol level. So it's like individual messages from the client to the server. And so if there's any issues with that as well, you can monitor the latencies. Um, now, uh, while that, it looks really like that's, that's great, we can trace all the, the messages. The real question is, how can you use this stuff to actually debug real uh, issues with Kafka or any sort of message bus system? Um, and so we're going to focus on Kafka here. Um, and uh, so the, we're going to use a demo. And I've got a slide here showing what the, the demo setup is. So we have a, a simple Kafka broker in the middle. Um, that's our message bus. And we have a, this is an e-commerce kind of website where you can place orders. So there's an order service, kind of that's our front end. It takes orders from the website. And when an order is made, it's just going to publish something um, or produce something to the Kafka broker into the order topic. And so it'll, it'll push that there. And then we have these two consumers on the right-hand side. Uh, one's called the shipping service, the other's the invoicing service. And these two services are just kind of constantly polling to see if there's any new orders inside of the, the message bus, inside of Kafka. And so they're co constantly trying to fetch from Kafka. And when they get something new, what they're gonna do is they're gonna take some action. So the shipping service would you know, initiate the shipping process and then the uh, invoicing service will um, you know, 
take the order, take that information and generate an invoice out of that. Now, when you have a Kafka broker, when you have an application that has something like a message bus in it, uh, one important question uh, that often arises is what's the, um, are my consumers keeping up with the data that's being produced? Is there any lag in my system? So for example, if the producer uh, creates a message with offset seven, offset is uh, Kafka's terminology. So just think of it like a, a, a message number seven and it pushes it to the Kafka broker, right? Um, ideally the shipping service and invoicing service immediately pull that same order number and start working on it, right? They pull it out of Kafka and start working on this order number seven. Um, but if there's any issue in your application, then you might see a lag and it's important to know if any of your services are running behind. And so this is often a question when you have a message bus is, is are my consumers lagging? Are they running behind? And this is sort of, so the demo we're gonna go into is gonna try to answer this question and we'll see how we can use Pixie to answer questions like this. Um, so with that, I'm going to switch. So we'll move, switch, go to, um, go to uh, Pixie. So I'm going to go to the homepage here for Pixie. Um, and then um, here's my cluster. So um, we have the main page. So I'm coming here to the main page of Pixie. And what you see is generally a service map of everything inside your cluster and some other information. But in this case, we're interested in Kafka, right? So um, there's a number of Kafka scripts. So if you click on the script button here, you can search for those by typing Kafka. And where I usually like to start with, um, like when I'm trying to just understand what's happening in an application is we have these flow graph scripts for diff various different protocols. In this case, we're looking, gonna look at Kafka flow graph. But the flow graph script kind of gives you a nice overview of what's happening inside of your system. And so when you click on that, the first thing it's gonna tell you is, oh, you require a namespace. So it says, what namespace are you trying to, to look at the flow graph for? In this case, our demo is in a namespace called Kafka demo, that's our application. So I'm gonna click that. And so immediately what you see is kind of all the Kafka traffic in your, in your namespace, in your application. And so I'm gonna, so on the right hand, right hand side here we have is the Kafka server itself. And I'm gonna move that here into the middle. And then on uh, these other circles are different pods. So we have an order pod that was our producer. I'm gonna drag this over to the right to just make it a little bit more clear. And then we have our two consumers, which are the shipping service and the invoicing service. And they're the ones fetching from Kafka. So on the left, we have order, it's, it's writing to Kafka. And then on the right, we have our two consumers, which are reading. So this matches exactly what we had in the diagram on the slide. And we're able to see that uh, instantly with Pixie that like, okay, who's talking to who and what's my setup? What are all the things that are reading and writing to, to the Kafka message bus? And so I find it a really useful place to start. Um, and then at the bottom, there's some various different metrics there too that you can monitor and kind of see in terms of latencies and throughput and such. But again, the question we were trying to answer, if you remember is, is are my uh, consumers keeping up with the producer? So as we produce orders, are we able to keep up? And so there's a different script dedicated for that. I'm going to type Kafka here again. And then we have a dedicated script called Kafka producer consumer latency. So I'm gonna click on this one. Um, and so when we come here, uh, first off, it shows you the list of producers that it knows about and the list of consumers that it knows about. And what we wanna do immediately is we wanna focus on a particular topic. So I'm just gonna populate that right now. And I'm gonna say, we're interested in the order topic. So we know that from our application that that our consumers and producers are writing to the order topic. And then we're gonna to wanna to say between any producer consumer combination, we wanna check for a lag. So we'll say, we only have one producer in this case. So I'll just put producer one, that was the name I got from the table here. And then on the right, we see we have our two consumers. Uh, so let's just check consumer shipping one, right? And we'll enter that in. And now we have a graph at the bottom. So. Um, we look at this and it doesn't look all that interesting, honestly, right? It's, it's, there's actually data there if you look carefully, it's a blue line at the bottom. And so what this is actually telling us is that um, the lag is zero all the time. Um, now this is good news. Like if you don't have a lag, it means as soon as the producer uh, made an order and pushed it into a Kafka, um, the consumer was able to fetch it immediately and start working on it immediately. And so it's telling us everything is healthy uh, with our Kafka setup and our application is doing just fine, right? 
Um, now I'm going to switch over to this other service that we have, which was the invoicing service. So I'm going to type uh, consumer invoicing one here, and we're going to check that one. And so here we see something different. It's not at zero. And I'm going to extend the time window here a little bit so we can see what's going on. And so what we see here is, uh, whoa, it's not zero. So this should be sending off alarm bells, right? Um, it started off at zero, but it's gradually been creeping up over time. Now, what's happened is as I've been talking through this demo, uh, my colleague Hannah has actually started some traffic onto our web application. So she started generating some traffic to our website and um, it started placing orders. And the shipping service that we looked at initially um, is efficient, so it's able to kind of keep up with the rate that Hannah set up, and it was able to process all the orders that were coming in and being posted to Kafka. But this other service, our invoicing service, seems to have some sort of performance issue, and it's falling further and further behind, right? The, the rate of orders that are coming in, it just can't keep up with them. So it started off kind of zero lag, but then it went up to like two seconds, then four seconds, and eight seconds and 16 seconds. And it's, it's trying, it's fetching data, starting to work on it. It's trying to work on them, work on work on them. And then, you know, it finishes that work and goes back to Kafka and says, what else do you have for me? And then Kafka overloads it with a bunch of more work because it's falling further and further behind. And so by the end of this time window, over this 10 minute window, it's already fallen like 60 seconds behind in, in its work. And this is super alarming in this case, right? It means we have a problem with our application. Um, if we actually come to the application itself, so in this tab, I have the application. Um, it's a very simple application, it's just meant for demo, so it's nothing fancy. But if you click on, click on shipping, what you'll see is all the shipments that have been made. And I'm going to scroll to the bottom here, and we see it has the last thing it knows about is shipment number uh, 1,253. And if I go to the invoicing page and we look at it, it thinks the last order that was made is 811. So we can actually see this problem manifested in the web application as well. Uh, we were able to catch it in Pixie, but we actually see the, the effect in the website. It's running behind. And if I refresh this page, you know, it is the invoicing service is trying really hard to kind of keep processing these things. It's now gone up to 827 but it's really not just able to keep up with the rate and it's falling behind. And this can be a frustrating experience. If imagine you were a customer and you were using this website, you wouldn't be happy because you're seeing conflicting information in the shipping and invoicing pages. Um, so what do you do in a situation like this, right? So once you kind of catch this sort of is issue with Pixie, you would wanna go back and see what's wrong with your invoicing service, right? There's clearly it's not able to keep up. So you'd probably wanna go back and maybe thread it so it can process more orders per second, or maybe there's some actual performance, performance issue in there that you want to go fix. So you maybe want to go study it. Is there some bottleneck somewhere that you need to relieve? Um, but then you do want to go fix it and make sure that this line goes back to zero. Um, so that's it for the demo. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, coming back to the slides, um, we we have a bunch of different scripts for Kafka. So we covered the flow graph. We covered the last one, which is the producer consumer latency. There's other ones that on your own time, you can go take a look at and see um, if they're useful for you and sorts, the sorts of questions that, that you can answer with them. Right. Um, and then this is gonna be the last slide that I wanna talk about. So we're switching gears a little bit here. Um, so we're done with the Kafka demo, uh, but I wanted to take a moment and talk about the Sterling roadmap. Sterling is our uh, eBPF based data collector. Um, and uh, it's what's getting all the data that feeds up into the rest of Pixie. And we have a number of tracks inside of Sterling that we work on. Uh, we have multiple tracks, but two of the major ones are the protocol tracing track and the CPU profiling track. Uh, the protocol tracing track is the one that uh, automatically grabs all your protocol traffic without you requiring any instrumentation. Um, and so it currently supports things like HTTP, gRPC for Go, MySQL, Postgres, a bunch of different databases. We have a bunch of protocols. And today we have now Kafka and NATS, which are in beta, um, and which we encourage you to play around with and, and see you know, what sort of information you can get out of them. And, and obviously, if you run into any issues, please do report them to us. Um, um, and so that's, those are the ones that are kind of done today. And where we want to go in the future with our protocol tracing is to kind of expand this, this set. Uh, so in no particular order, things that we're looking at are uh, things like gRPC for 
C++, and that would cover interpreted languages too. Um, gRPC for Java, uh, MQP, MongoDB, and there's others, right? And if there's any other protocols uh, the community is interested in as well, please do get in touch with us because we're always trying to keep a pulse on what's important to the community. Um, and then on the other track, the CPU profiling track, this is the feature that provides you with the uh, popular flame graphs. Uh, it's been a, it's been a kind of a, a popular feature of ours. Um, today we support profiles, CPU profiles for Go, Rust, and C++. So you can see the nice looking flame graphs for those languages if your application is written in Go, Rust, or C++. Um, and we're looking to add support for other languages. So uh, things like Java um, and maybe Python and Ruby are things are, Python and Ruby are a little bit further out on the horizon, but we're at, top priority for us is actually Java next is to take a look at Java. Um, and so that's just give you, I just want to give you a little bit of a taste of where we've been and uh, where we're going. And uh, so that's it for Kafka and the Sterling Roadmap. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Vihong, who's going to talk about end-to-end -end encryption. Um, we'll keep the questions for the end. All right. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Vihong. Uh, I'm one of the engineers at Pixie, and I'm here to sort of talk to you about a new feature we just we recently added to Pixie. Um, however, before we get into some of the very nitty gritty details about end-to-end -end encryption, I want to start by quickly doing a recap of the uh, data model and how, how your data is collected and stored in Pixie. So this is like a very high level uh, rough architecture of what how your data flows through Pixie. Um, so data collected by Pixie, what the, the work that the Sterling team is doing, all of that data is stored just locally in your cluster. Um, our script execution framework also runs within your own cluster. So the data processing itself is also happening within the cluster itself. Um, so when, when the Pixie client, let's say you're running the UI as Omid should, or maybe you're using a Pixie CLI or something like that, when the client needs um, some data to render, what happens is the client sends the script to the cluster, uh, and then all of the data processing is done in the cluster, uh, and then the script results are sent back to the client. Um, so in one of the models, what happens is that the client will directly connect to the cluster uh, to fetch the process data. So this is what we call direct mode, and this is what we are indicating on the right side of the graph you're seeing. Um, in this situation, you know, your client is directly fetching the result data from the cluster. Uh, a disadvantage of direct mode that we had to uh, address here at Pixie when we're testing our own product, and also we have noticed elsewhere, is that in this scenario, your clusters might actually be behind some firewalls. And then now you have to like punch some holes in these firewalls for all of the Pixie clients to be able to access these clusters and get the script results from. So to address that challenge uh, and simplify sort of the firewall configuration, uh, we built a way for the Pixie cloud to proxy the script results. Um, uh, this is what we call pass-through mode. Uh, and so this uh, pass-through mode is a convenience method where Pixie Cloud is just proxying the data between the cluster and the clients. Uh, the, the data isn't persisted anywhere uh, in the cloud. It's just a, a proxy for, for the data. Um, and then just a quick reminder, like Pixie Cloud itself is also open source. So when we open source Pixie, it's not just the Vizier parts of Pixie, but also cloud. Uh, so folks can run, uh, folks in the community can run Pixie Cloud themselves. Uh, and so in pass-through mode, it would still be flowing through an instance of Pixie Cloud that is controlled by you. Um, no matter which of these two data transfer modes you use, uh, all of these connections do still use TLS. Uh, so the data is always point-to-point -point encrypted uh, in transit. Um, However, even in this uh, scenario, it is still possible that you might want to use Pixie Cloud for the convenience, uh, but you might be running a Pixie Cloud instance in an environment you don't fully trust. Um, so we, we really wanted to address that scenario where you're using pass-through mode with Pixie Cloud, you like that convenience, uh, but you still want to sort of protect your data in transit. Um, so to address that, we decided to work on end-to-end uh, -end encryption. 
So end-to-end -end encryption will provide an additional layer of security where the data itself gets encrypted uh, at the Pixie Vizier uh, and will stay encrypted during transit and only the client will decrypt the data. Um, so we can dive into some of the details uh, behind how we implemented this end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so thankfully there was, uh, there is an IETF uh, proposed standard for data encryption. Uh, it's called uh, JOSE, or I don't know what the pronunciation is. I didn't see any guidelines for it, uh, but basically this was a new standard uh, that was proposed for encryption of JavaScript uh, data. Um, even though this is not a completely accepted internet standard yet, it's just a, a proposed standard. Uh, there's already client libraries in many different languages. Um, so we were able to use the cryptography API, which is supported by all major browsers to, uh, to do this on the client side when you're using the UI. And then for the CLI, which we've written in Golang, uh, we use JWX and then the Golang and Python APIs use JWX and Oslib uh, respectively. Um, so basically you can, you can get into an encryption no matter which of the Pixie clients you're using. And then let's walk through like an uh, example of how end-to-end -end encryption would work from the UI. Um, so what happens is before we can make any requests to Vizier for data, uh, the browser first has to generate a key pair. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we use the Web Crypto API for this uh, that all major browsers support. Uh, and the first thing that the browser does is generates a key pair. Um, this key pair is then um, so, uh, the public key from this key pair is then sent to Vizier's on every request to run a script. So uh, anytime you want to get script results, uh, the, the UI, the browser will send this public key along with the rest of the request uh, to the Vizier's. Um, uh, as before, all of the data processing is done on Vizier side. Uh, however, now there's an additional step before Vizier responds with the data. Uh, the Vizier will use the, this public key and encrypt the table data uh, before sending any response out. And now the response that Vizier responds with uh, on a successful script execution uh, will be encrypted with this public key. Uh, and the, this encrypted table data then is sent back to the client, um, uh, either through Pixie Cloud if you're using pass-through mode or uh, directly if you're using a direct mode connection. And then the browser, which generated the key pair to begin with, um, has access to the private key uh, of the key pair, which is still controlled by the browser. It wasn't sent to anyone else. Uh, and so the browser can use the private key to decrypt the results and render the UI uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, a reminder that the private key will never leave the browser. In fact, the private key is scope to the session storage on the browser. So the same user using Pixie on different computers or different browsers will have different key pairs. Uh, and these private keys will be local to their browser st session storage. Um, uh, as far as the CLI and the APIs go, they behave the same way. You just replace the browser with either a Go-based binary uh, or the Go or Python uh, API clients uh, that are equal. And, and instead of using the Web Crypto API, they will use uh, the libraries in Go and Python, uh, the crypto libraries there. Uh, so that's sort of a very quick view on how end-to-end -end encryption works. Um, and this basically now gives you this additional guarantee that if you're using pass-through mode, uh, your data is still encrypted even when it's proxying through Pixie Cloud. Uh, and that sort of gives you the freedom of uh, having full guarantee that no one can sort of uh, look at this data in the cloud, no matter what environment Pixie Cloud's running in. So that's, that's all I have. Um, happy to take questions at the end. Okay, well, um, thanks everyone uh, for coming to the meeting. Uh, I just have a few quick updates about the community. Um, and, and what we're planning to do moving, moving forward. So Pixie was officially accepted as a CNCF sandbox project. So we're currently in the process of actually transferring ownerships of all of our assets, including our GitHub repo to the CNCF. Um, 
And as part of this process, once our repo is moved out to CNCF, we'll also be opening up all of our issue tracking <coughs> and, and roadmap. Um, in addition, I wanted to say we plan to have a live event at KubeCon in North America, um, assuming that that event still happens in person. Uh, and that is planned for the week of October 11th. Um, and please stay tuned for the details. And we also plan to have a Pixie governance board meeting in October. Uh, so stay tuned for all those. And you know, we look forward to, to seeing everyone on, on future calls and events. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to hang on. We'll, we'll stay on for a few more minutes. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Omid, I have a question. Um, is, are there ways for the community to contribute to protocol tracing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we got, uh, we've gotten a number of requests about that um, in terms of how to contribute protocols. There's a lot of people out in the community who want to who have a protocol of interest that has not been supported yet. Um, obviously, we're working hard to get those out, but it's great to have community contributions as well. And so one of our goals for um, a future Pixie Knot meeting is to actually outline the steps that's required to implement your own protocol parser um, so that you can just plug it in. So it's the way that Sterling's structured is there is a protocols directory where you can go just implement your own protocol parser, but we're trying to make it a little bit easier to use and document um, all the exact steps that you need to go through and the pitfalls and, and things that we've learned along the way. And once we have that document ready, uh, we'll release that out to the community and we highly encourage people to to contribute, It'd be super awesome. And, and there have been some people out there who have already taken the initiative to try to implement a, a number of protocol processes and we're super excited about that. Um, and we're just trying to make it easier for everyone who wants to contribute. So stay tuned, um, we'll, we'll be publishing a doc for that. Another question that we've gotten on Slack a lot is, um, can you share how Pixie traces encrypted traffic? And like, what are the, what are the limitations for that? Yeah, so um, let's see, I think we have, do we still have that backup slide? Um, oh, let me, let me just go to here. Um, so we can use this slide here to take a look. So um, the way that Pixie, like the Sterling engine of Pixie traces things is we typically trace things at, uh, using eBPF K probes at the Linux API. And there we're able to trace all of the kind of read and write traffic. So anytime a network call is made to like send, send packets or receive packets or send a message, or receive a message, we trace that information. Um, and then we're able to reconstruct what was happening uh, through our protocol parsers and then surface that up into um, the rest of Pixie. Um, with uh, encrypted traffic uh, that, we can't capture at the, at the kernel interface anymore uh, because if we capture at the kernel interface, all the data is gonna look encrypted to us and that's kind of useless. Um, so what we do in that case is we actually use eBPF again, but we add different sorts of probes. We add probes on the SSL and TLS libraries themselves um, and we trace the data right before it gets encrypted. And then we combine it with all the other uh, information that we have and kind of plug it into the rest of the Sterling framework to parse the protocols and do all the, the rest of the magic. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, we just have additional probes before, right before the data gets encrypted at the interface of the TLS SSL library. Um, and by capturing that data, that's how we're able to see the encrypted data. Um, and it works for OpenSSL and uh, Go's crypto TLS library currently. Um, so the, yes, the traffic has to go through one of those two libraries. If it goes through some other custom library, then we don't currently trace it. But, but those two libraries cover a good, I mean, with OpenSSL alone, we cover a really large swath of the traffic because a lot of people are using OpenSSL. Great, well, thanks for that, Omid. Um, and yeah, everyone, please feel free to, to join stuff on our Slack community and ask questions there or file GitHub issues. And thanks again for, uh, for joining. Bye.